my two wonderful guests, Tando on my left and Udozima on my right. Welcome. I'm going to first ask them to each read from their book, their first reading. Tando, we'll start with you. Have you tested your mics? You don't have one. Nick Tando. Hello, everyone. Okay, I feel like standing up. Um, thank you so much. No, I feel like standing. I need to express myself. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read you a short passage from A Man Who's Not a Man. This is my debut novel. Uh, I've got three other, two other books. Um, this one is now 10 years old, which makes me very old. Um, <laughs> it's not time for questions yet. <laughs> okay. What's ironic is that I don't discuss these things with Amakwala, new men, either. Not even those that I've visited at the huts during seclusion and taught what I know about manhood. By the time they get to the house of the lamp, they know everything there is to know about being a man thanks to my instruction. I help, I help to make men. But their initiation, but when their initiation is over and they're being welcomed as real men, I see in their eyes how confused that they are that I, who has taught them so much, should be called a bogus man. Yet these things we never talk about. I wish they would ask me, because that would give me the opening to talk freely with them about my own experiences. These days I'm more comfortable with men of other tribes than my own. This type I let into my space freely. Our discussions about manhood begin on a level premise that we all of us not men as prescribed by my particular culture. So we debate cross-culturally without limitations or coded exchanges meant to prove that some are less manly than others. These talks are fruitful all round. But all, this, all of this has made me lead a split life for a very long time. I've had, I've had to learn to be a real man among real men while simultaneously being an ordinary man among ordinary men. All the energy it takes to live the life of a split man, constantly having to defend myself through silence for my unique path into manhood. Sometimes when the frustration of having no voice, no space to be a man in my own right grows too much for my head people, I feel my manhood shrinking. I feel it curl to the side like an earthworm. That is why I decided, shit, I'm letting the story out to make myself heard and claim my space as a man once and for all. It's also a way of cheating those bastards who've been volunteering uncalled for tales about my fail. I've got you, you rumor mongers. You've been going around gossiping about me in dark corners, and I admit I'm, I'm, I have been bothered about, about it. Well, I've made your job easier by writing this, don't you think? You've got it now from the horse's mouth. Apologies for another cliche. Actually, I'm not half as bothered by the gossip as I used to be. Strangely enough, my supposedly failed circumcision has made me feel more of a real man, not less. If manhood is about enduring pain in its figurative and literal sense, then I dare say I have more than end, I've more than ended. I understand now what Om Den meant when he said, Ubuto Dalitre Bom for Wam. Hi, everyone. Hi. So I'm going to read a section from the fourth chapter of my book, uh, my latest novel, Speak No Evil. Um, and so just to give you context, the main character, Niru, is coming back to Nigeria. Um, on a trip with his father. The airplane rumbles to a full stop, shaking the luggage in the bins overhead and the seat backs in front. I watch my father relax his grip on the armrests, cross himself and mutter a silent prayer of thanks before he opens his eyes to cast sideways glances at the passengers already standing in the aisle. See our people, my father says. 
but I press my forehead against the window and look out at the carcasses of scrapped airplanes rusting in the tall grass by the tarmac. The terminal looms into view with its powerful lights trained on airplanes waiting to unload passengers and cargo before quickly loading up again for return journeys to America, Europe, and the Middle East, maybe even China. I watch men and women in reflective yellow jackets scramble around the luggage crates and large wheeled utility trucks and tugs. I'm too far away to see the sweat on their faces, but I can feel the heat and humidity already. It's good stuff. Who ordered that cappuccino? <laughs> All right. Whoever, it better be good coffee. All right. Um, but I can, sorry, uh, uh, I watch men and women in reflective yellow jackets scramble around the luggage crates and large wheeled utility trucks and tugs. I'm too far away to see the sweat on their faces, but I can feel the heat and humidity already. My father inhales deeply as he struggles to remove his sweater and roll up his shirt sleeves. He checks for his passport and asks me to double check for mine. The thin green book sits safely in the backpack pocket that should hold my smartphone, but I don't have a smartphone anymore. I pull it out and hand it to him. He caresses the cover and then slips it into his shirt pocket. When the seatbelt sign blinks off, he springs up from his seat. Come on, he says, be fast now, let's go. My father becomes an entirely different man when we come to Nigeria. OJ came up with a term for the condition during a trip we took the summer after his first year in medical school. He said, Daddy has a bad case of Nigeria Toma, an acute swelling of ego and pride that affects diaspora Nigerian men, rendering them unable to accept the idea that a true home, home might exist outside of their birth country. Symptoms may vary, but are exceptionally pronounced upon return to the native soil and include hyperactivity, elevated mood, grandiose thinking, and increased aggression. The differential includes bipolar disorder, and indeed those afflicted have much in common with patients observed in the thrall of a manic episode. The duration of symptoms may vary, but poor electricity, bad roads, and exposure to extreme heat have proven effective as treatment. My mother laughed at that, my father too, but only because OJ said it. My father's transformation is swift. His chest puffs out and his arms swing into action. He forces his way through the airport meeting, meeting with each official who dares to slow his entry into the promised land with a try me stare, and uh, a try me stare down where appropriate, and a conjoling mix of pigeon and Igbo. He seems taller as he leans towards these officials, forcing them to shrink back in the face of his momentum. Mr. Jacob, the driver my father always uses when he comes home, stands for us waiting by his black Toyota Camry when we finally step out from the arrivals terminal into the shouting mass of men with dust-reddened, irritated, and sleep-deprived eyes, each asking if we need a taxi. It's hot, and there's a vague smell of decay and burning as if the whole world smolders. It surrounds me and seeps into me. I blink at these figures in long-sleeved shirts unbuttoned at the collar with their dress slacks or jeans, and wondering how they can possibly survive wearing such heavy clothes. They have wet patches beneath their arms. They wipe their faces with handkerchiefs every other minute. Looking at them makes me feel hot and tired. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll start with you, Dozima. Um, can you, in your own words, tell us what the novel is about and how the story came to you? Why the story? Sure. So Speak No Evil is a novel about a young Nigerian-American boy who is accidentally outed to his parents and the drama that ensues in their family. Um, and it's, you know, it's not necessarily a happy book. That's half of the book. The other half of the book deals a lot with um, something that's very prevalent in the United States right now, which is this police brutality. Um, and I, I say it like that so as to not kind of give away what happens in the book, but that's basically what the book is about. Um, you know, and how did I come to the book? Well, I mean, it's a long journey. The book was initially a, a book about, um, it was supposed to be a book, a collection of intertwined stories about terrorism in the United States. And from there, somehow we got to a, a book about sort of a young person finding himself and finding out about his own sexuality and sexual identification. 
you know, and I think a lot of it has to do with the way that the world sort of changes as you write a book. When I started writing the book, um, the issues that I think were front and center in American um, consciousness and in my mind were maybe a little bit different. Um, now, you know, it took me about six or seven years to write this book, just even though it's really short, so that will tell you how, how focused I am. Um, but I think, you know, the thing was, the conversation in the, like, around me, I think, started to shift both here and also in the United States, and this idea of what is the immigrant experience of today? What happens when, you know, the sort of, like, older traditional values of sort of the, of, of a parent's generation clash with maybe the narratives and the values of a younger generation, and how does that play out within a traditional family structure? Um, you know, so Nero's coming out to his parents, and, and that tension between him and mainly his father is one, is one sort of like thing that was whirling around in my head. And then the other, of course, was this idea of how do black people survive in an environment that is just intentionally hostile towards them? Um, and how do, you, how do you go through the, um, how does one grow up essentially and experience all the, the pain and the joys of growing up um, in an environment that doesn't allow you to grow up, that assumes that you are grown before your time? You? Same question for me. Yep. Well, when I heard the question, I thought, what lie am I going to tell today? Because the <laughs> question has been asked many times, obviously, and um, I kind of have a different answer every time. <laughs> um, but all of them are kind of true, because you never have really one reason why you're writing a book, and you find some reasons while you're doing it. So anyway, um, first of all, you know, I had been writing other manuscripts, you know, I was developing as a writer, and I had decided that year that I want to have a publishable manuscript by the end of the year, and I will know when I've arrived there. And so I was picking different subjects, and the subject of male circumcision was a big one uh, in South Africa because, you know, certain nations in the country do still practice uh, traditional male circumcision. So it was a big one, um, and I thought, hey, how come nobody's ever written a novel about this? We've had some TV series that were controversial and all of that, but a novel, something that would, would give a comprehensive account of, of what happens. So I wrote this story about a young man who is basically transitioning from, um, from youth to being an adult. And I wanted to explore the factors that affect you know, young black men uh, as they transition, as they make the transition from childhood to, to manhood in South Africa, post-apartheid and all of that. Um, and I use traditional male circumcision therefore as, as a canvas. And what, what made it a big deal at the time is that every circumcision season in South Africa, there are reports of young men dying en masse. We're talking hundreds of young men dying from septicemia, from botch circumcision, and all of that. And there was no real account for this. We just get the news, and then we move on. The next season comes. And one of the haunting thoughts that I had at the time was, if we had white people dying in as many numbers, the world will come to a stop. But somehow, because, because these are black bodies, it really does not matter. Uh, we just move on and we just keep on, you know, saying the statistics is going up and so on. So it, this haunted me and I wanted to tell the story of who these young men are because when we see them on TV, they've got white clay, we don't know their names, we can't really say whose, child, whose children they are, whose brothers, you know, they are and so on. So I wanted to humanize um, one young man and I wanted to also just interrogate some of the issues that were coming up, because the reports would say, I, these young men are too fragile, that's why they're not making it as men, that's why they get defeated in the mountain. And I wanted to say, that can't be true. There has to be something wrong with the culture, and let's try to find out what that might be. And, and that's, that's how the novel came about. Have you, um, um, I want you to talk, because I know you have. <laughs> I'm, I'm answering my own question. Talk a little bit about what it has meant to to you and what you what the backlash has been for daring to write so openly about something that um, especially in South Africa yeah. people would feel you are opening um, our tra our uh, 
traditions up to, you know, white gays and, yeah. Um, so it's taken me a while to speak honestly about, about this. Um, we all know that when you push the boundaries in society, society ostracizes you, society punishes you when you do this. And it's taken me a while to speak honestly about it because there was personal cost. Um, so I'll start with that. Um, last two weeks ago, I met my mother for the first time after 10 years um, because I was kicked out of my, of my home in the village because my uncle felt that um, I had put the family in disrepute by challenging the culture. And the thing is, my uncle is, you know, he's, he's one of, he's part of the ed educated elite. You know, he went to the University of Forte, so he was rolling with the Corsa Kings and all of that. So they wanna hold him to account that, how, how, how is your family selling us out like this? So he had to find, he had to find a way of punishing me. So I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna walk out and if you want me, you, you will follow me. So I mean, that's, that's a painful thing to go through and it's taken me a while to speak honestly about that. Um, but the backlash from society, uh, Zugis was laughing because in our, in our first, in my first launch in Johannesburg, uh, we were waiting for the facilitator, she was kind of late, and when she came, she said, hey, I'm sorry I was delayed because the chairperson of the House of Traditional Leaders, you know, the in parliament, these people, um, I just bumped into him outside and, you know, he was asking where I'm going and I said, you know, th there's this book, you might be interested in it. And he said, oh no, I'm aware of it. In fact, we're motivating for the book to be banned. I was a bit concerned and then I was like, bring it on. I mean, if you're gonna ban a book, it's, it's, it's wonderful. You're canonizing it. Like you couldn't ask for better. Um, so there was that, but what was curious for me was that nobody ever came to me to say anything. I mean, I've had people walk out, you know, but no one came to me or threatened me physically or any of that. I hear it from my friends, from family and all of that. But the backlash was definitely there and was coming mostly from people who hadn't read the book. They were contesting the idea of the sacred culture that is not spoken about being written about in the first place. Not, what, not the content, not what I'm saying, but the very idea of it being, um, being written about. And I would be lying if I'm saying that it was only backlash that came through. This is probably my most successful book. Um, and it was appreciated, mostly by black women. I remember when it had just been published, I got a, a text message while I was about to go to stage. And um, we didn't have smartphones then, it was Nokia, you know those Nokias? And when the message is very long, it breaks it down to like five. <laughs> So you have to open it and then wait for it. So I was like reading this thing and it was a text message from a number that I didn't know, but it turned out to be from a mother of an initiate who had gone to the mountain a couple of years um, before. And the mother was saying, thank you so much for writing this book because my son went to the mountain. I kind of picked up that things were not going all right, but because as a woman, I don't have a right to know what happens, you know, because what happens in the mountain stays in the mountain. I was never really told what happened. When he came out, he committed suicide. And as a mother, I couldn't, and I can't be told, you know, what happened. And he can't tell me. And so by reading this story, I'm beginning to imagine the kind of pain that he may have gone through, the kind of thinking that you know, he, he may have had, that may have led to him making this decision. And this is, you know, the overwhelming response that I got, particularly from mothers, from sisters, from black women, rather than, you know, the expected backlash from men who are just protecting their culture at all costs, even when it kills them. Thank you. Um, so. Fathers and sons. Um, I would like to talk a bit about it. I f just recently also finished. He was sitting in the audience. Where has he gone? Talk Facebook. A particular kind of black man. And I, um, can you talk a bit about, and it's fascinating, this, uh, of course, the complexity of African parenting. 
in the diaspora and on the continent and the trauma of it. Can you talk a little bit about it? Don't worry about it. I'm fiddling. Of his relationship with his dad, with yeah. his dad. I mean, I think to start from a larger perspective, I think, Tanda, what you were saying about sort of men being protectors of tradition, I think is something that, you know, we probably see, I mean, it's not just in South Africa, right? It's here as well. This sort of desire to hang on to tradition at all costs in some cases. And I wonder if that's, you know, if that has a lot to do with this, this, this need for something to prop up, you know, a sense of self. Um, and you know, if you can't do that internally, then you look to the external thing. You look to tradition to say to to give you the framework for understanding your own life in a world that's rapidly shifting around you. Um, and I think, you know, in in my book, and I think in general, what I'm looking at is how does that then impact when you know the person that you're bringing up when your child has a completely different framework for understanding the world. Um, and the conflicts between Nehru and his father, um, his father being a very traditional. Christian oriented uh, Nigerian man who's living in the United States, you know, very, you, know, you would say alpha male masculine in that sense, I think has a lot to do with that. It's about this, this father clinging to this old framework of who he is, how he's defined by society around him and how he defines himself in relation to that. And then a son who completely doesn't fit that mold and what that, you know, that there's necessarily going to be conflict in that situation. And I think, you know, that's what drives a lot of the book is this inability of the two of them to really understand. One who's trying to build his own set of traditions and the other who can't give up the traditions that really he feels have made him who he is. I mean, I, I, I just want to add something to this. I mean, this idea of holding on to, you know, to cultures at all costs. You know, I've, been, I've had to think about this, and I'm thinking that I'm just going to like add one specific thing. I think that we have to reflect on the fact that um, we were colonized, still are, and a part of that process was about, a big part of it was about eroding ourselves, our sense of being. Um, you know, so, so anything that, that made us who we are was barbaric, it was erased, it was changed, and we were supposed to be civilized and to subscribe to other cultures, to other ways of being. And then you ask yourself, why would something like traditional male circumcision remain? Because it's like it's being allowed to stay. I mean, we fought. The land was not taken without us fighting. They took the things that mattered to us. But why would they allow these things to happen? You know, I, I wonder, you know, it's a troubling thought because if white people did not want that shit to happen, they would have stopped it. We would not hear of it. But somehow this is permitted. And even now when we think, for example, you know, the case of traditional male circumcision in South Africa, boys are dying en masse every season and nothing is happening. You know, and I keep returning to this idea, if, if 60 young white men were dying every six months in that, the world would literally come to a stop. So I'm saying some of these cultures, it's not just us holding on to them, but someone who has the power to take away or to allow things is allowing this to, to happen. And then I just wanna say that part of why we hold on to, to these cultures is because everything else was taken away and then we hold on to this even when it kills us because we wanna hold on to a sense of yeah, this is who we were, you know, we can't, we can't remember who we were before we interrupted, and this is the only point of reference to this. And we don't know how to evolve, we don't know how to let this culture evolve, and anyone who's trying to, to question that is, is colonizing us, is oppressing us again, you know, and then we just hold on to it, even when it's like eating us up. You know, it's, it's a kind of incomplete thought, but... Yeah. I mean, I would just add to what you're saying, and I think what you know, I try to do in the personal sense is, is put up this idea that there is no, I mean, I get very nervous when people say, try to act like culture is a, is a packageable thing. It is and it isn't, right? Like culture, like culture is a very mutable thing. It moves constantly. Like everything is influenced by the outside. There's no culture that exists in isolation. And so if somebody gets up and says, this is not our culture, but can't actually answer for you what is our culture, because what is our culture changes over time, even if it's within a particular place, and is also supremely influenced by all of the other interactions around it. I mean, I, you know, I think, for example, if you look at you know, where my mom is from, you, know, you could say, my mom's from Oguashiuku, right? And so the, the whole royal tradition there is supremely influenced by the Benin Empire, but it's now its own 
royal tradition, but you could say that, oh, this is our own culture, but your own culture is influenced by forces from the East, forces from the West, forces from the South, and then also from external forces, you know, say from, from Europe and whatnot. So how do you then package what is your culture even in, a, and say that this is, this is something that can't change? Even within, um, you know, the conflicts between the father and son in, this, in my particular book, this idea of what is Christian and what is not Christian, what, what is godly behavior and what is ungodly behavior, that question is extremely, you know, it's, like, it's one in which you can't say that this is, it's just there's no solid thing there. And I think that's what the tension is. And that's what, you know, these stories are supposed to illustrate, this idea that this thing is super fluid and conflict arises when you try to make it static and then, and then make rules around something that cannot be made static. Um, to you. Uh, <laughs> I love this. Um, the, just ignore I'm going like, to ignore you know, them. They're, they're trying to be part of this. There's a loud group out. over here. Ignore them. And they are sitting in front. Usually misbehavior goes to the back. <laughs> so the, your lead character, you do a lot with your lead character. What's his name again? For Lungi Le Chris. Thank you. Um, First of all, it's a, it, it, it's a story within a story, right? He's sometimes a bit unreliable. Mm -hmm. and, but then he also, there's this journey to, I think, redemption and acceptance. Can you talk a bit about how you got there? Yeah. So, I mean, um, first of all, I, I write mostly in first-person prose, you know, because I, I want the vulnerability. I'm really interested, I'm not interested in what actually happened. I'm interested in what the character tells himself happened. So you can see how he deceives himself sometimes and so on, so he becomes an unreliable you know, uh, character. And I love that. I mean, I think that's the beauty of literature. Um, he does a lot of things. He is a young man. One of the big themes that I wanted to deal with was Again, you know, colonization meant that you know, the settlers came and drove us to the periphery of society, which is how in South Africa, for example, villages were created and labor camps that we call townships like Soweto were created. And, and so what you have, you've got the city and you've got black people traveling from the city to come and find work, I mean from the villages to come and find work uh, in the city. And so you have a sense of there's home in the city and then there's a home home. And I think this is a universal thing, black people across the world, we know that. I'm glad you say that because South Africans, you guys talk like everything is so unique. Yeah, we need to, <laughs> South Africans need to wake up to the fact that first of all, they are in Africa. Because sometimes they, they like, Thank they you. forget. <laughs> Which is, why, which is why something like Abandu Book Festival exists, because we must go you. and educate our people. They, Thank you. I mean, they don't even know that they were in exile in these countries not too long ago. Thank you. Something is not right. No. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I wanted to deal with this, this, this rural urban migration which polarized, that, that undid the family structure, the black family structure. Um, you have, you have you have miners who would move to Johannesburg from the villages. They would have a family here. They would have a family this side. There's a thing called Kumbulikaya where families are looking for, <laughs> are looking for, like, my, I haven't seen my mother, my, my, my father since 1972. He left to go and find work. And then the TV crew, you know, goes and kind of locates them and finds them with a whole family there. <laughs> it happens. So I wanted to explore this. So this young man moves from the village um, and then he goes to the city to find his dad, and then, you know, he wakes up to a different reality. And, you know, I was kind of reflecting my own, my own um, experience there. I was never as shocked as when I got to Cape Town as a 12-year-old and I discovered shacks. I was like, people live in these things. Because to us in the villages, shacks, it's a pigsty or a chicken coo, but people don't live in, you know, um, wooden and zinc structures. Um, it doesn't matter how poor you are in the village, you know, there's a house for you. No one, no one sleeps outside. There are no beggars and that kind of thing. So he goes through this and he discovers the city. And, um, and then he becomes a part of the troubled youth. He experiments with drugs. He ends up being a petty you know, criminal. They break into the white suburbs in, 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 in Cape Town. 
and he is forced to reflect about his life. That you know, the possibility here is that I may die or I may go to prison, which is what happens to young black men in our country. And then he goes back to the village and discovers you know, the tranquility. He, he, he learns humanness anew. I wanted to explore that because it's quite a thing. And the difference is, the idea is the villages are backward and the city is better. But he, the reverse is true for him, so he reflects on this. I also wanted to write a novel about a village because a lot of novels are based in the city and we don't do the village, and when we do, we don't do it well. You know, I wanted to do that very well. You mean so, you people don't do it well? I mean, exactly, I know. There's so many things that we don't do, that well, we don't do. you do a lot of things well, but... Uh, I know. I mean, yesterday, I'm, I'm gonna keep quiet. Well apart. <laughs> I'm what? Oh, sorry. Are you done? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, to you. Um, so I'm going to be honest. I was hmm, Nero's friend Meredith. This um, talk a little bit. Talk about Meredith. I, I was a bit irritated. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a white, um, it's a white girl. So yeah. So <laughs> Nero is is 18 years old, or 17, 17, 18 years old. Um, he's in his last year of high school, and his best friend is this white girl named Meredith, who's also the same age, and she is, has a crush, is in love with, with Nero, but because he comes out, she ends up, that ends up not being requited love, right? So what then ensues um, between the two of them is this weird dance where she then takes it upon herself to make sure that he can find love, essentially. And that's where a lot of the problems start. But that's in the beginning of the book. Later, I think what you see is, um, you know, it really in a lot of ways is a story not just about, about Nero, but it is a story about Meredith and, and this idea of a journey through entitlement. I um, mean, I would say that both of the characters are pretty entitled individuals in their own way. Um, I think Meredith's entitlement manifests a lot because she doesn't recognize how entitled she is. Whereas Nero, in a sense, maybe doesn't recognize how privileged he is. Um, and how, how, in some ways, how much opportunity he's been given. Meredith doesn't understand just how, how reckless she is with her power. Um, and it's the, her recklessness with power that ends up causing a lot of problems for both Nero and Meredith as the story unfolds. You know, again, I'm being a little bit, um, you know, vague because, you know, I want you to read what happens in the book. Um, you know, and, and I think, that, you know, the thing about Meredith is it is really trying to, she, she is both her own character, her own self, but also stands in for a lot of what I think uh, represents what's happening in white America right now and in the United States of America. And it is about, you know, if these two characters are archetypes or these two characters are symbols for, for larger issues or larger problems, you know, there's a reason why you would be pretty irritated with Meredith. The first round of questions. I am um, I'm in the chair, so I just want to tell you, you are not allowed to ask the writers what they are working on next. <laughs> Kina doesn't allow that at a panel I moderate. Okay. <laughs> Who has the mic? Also, refrain from long comments. You are allowed to comment you like the book, but refrain from long comments. The the where you are standing, yes, right there. Oh, great, okay. Um, so I wanted to say, Tando, you, we hear a lot about the backlash you, you got after a man who's not a man, and we hear a lot about how you deal with questions about uh, tradition and loyalty and all of that, but I'm, I'm really, I've always been curious about how that backlash um, has affected you as an artist and how it's shaped how and what you write. And just very much in terms of form and um, um, even if it, it shapes the decisions you make about what you, what you go on to write next. Yeah. Um, hello everyone, good afternoon. My question, my name is Sin. I run CCTNG. My question is to Uzodima. 
Um, I know your parents are liberals. We all know your mother and we all know your father. And I'm sure that in that liberalism, they trained you in a certain way. My question is, how much emotional digging did you have to dig to create Nero's character? Because I'm assuming that for someone who has a mother like Ngozi, she would have, you know, raised you in a liberal way, per se, and someone who grew up abroad, not really in Nigeria, per se, mingling with both cultures, it would have been easier than somebody who is a member of the LGBT community in Nigeria here. So how much emotional investment did you have to go to create the new character? <laughs> Put your hand down. Answer your question. Okay. So, um, Kaki, so I think that when I'm, um, I almost said 50, but 50 is too close, so I'm just going to push it a bit back. When I'm like 80 and I'm reading all of my work and I'm looking back, I may be able to answer that question, you know, honestly and accurately. It's an, it's an ongoing thing for me. Um, nevertheless, I want to say that I've always been someone who wants to write, you know, literature that bites and stings us. Uh, I want to write about the stuff that no one else is writing about, maybe have, has not had the courage to, to write about. And it's what I continue to try to do, even after the backlash of a man who's not a man. I mean, the example is, um, you know, I co-wrote this movie um, that was banned recently in, in South Africa. Um, so that's, that's not really someone who's afraid. <laughs> um, you know, breaking away from, from the colonial literal establishment in South Africa and starting something. But I do have those fears. I do think about it. And it takes a lot for me to decide, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to do this. Because this is who I am. Otherwise, I would not be able to live with myself. So I face the page with the same kind of attitude. Um, but I do feel like a bone sitting here sometimes. I'm like, you know, who am I going to offend, you know? Um, I'll make an example, you know, when the movie came out um, last year and people were marching and marching to cinemas and all of that, I did have a moment where I was really afraid. But I had a two-year-old child and I thought, this cannot be our lives. I mean, our actors were going into exile. The production team was gathering everyone to protect them and, and all of that. I said, I cannot live that life. And what I did was to take my daughter and put her on a pram and we went to the mall. And we went to the cinema because I was not going to live that life. So I tried to do that. It's a risky, it's a life that I've chosen. Yeah, so. That's a lot of questions that you asked, um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to answer in this way. To start first with, I think in order to answer your question, we have to start first with this idea of, of like not really a Nigerian, right? Which I think, you know, I, I understand what you're trying to say, but I do take a bit of issue with it, right? And I'll say this, that I think we are all Nigerian in the way that we choose to be Nigerian, right? So that, and this is something that I think I'll say that I had to learn by coming back here to live and work. You know, I think if you grow up abo abroad, then there is this idealized version of Nigeria, right? Which is, it's the mother country. It's where you'll find a certain understanding of your identity. And then, you know, that, that is the true, pure identity. And, you know, if you want to be real, like sometimes the way that you're raised is like, you have to go to the village. And it's in village life that you'll find your, your Nigerian identity. And it's just not true, right? So I think what it is is we're all constructing our identities in the midst of a, of a society that is continuously and constantly shifting, right? So the Nigeria that my parents knew, the Nigeria that your parents knew is very different from the Nigeria that everyone here is growing up in, right? So that's what I want to start as a baseline. Um, and so I would say that for me, I've, I have spent the last, I don't know how many years, like trying to figure out, okay, what is my Nigerian identity and how do I access that? Now, that is, of course, my identity is, then of, of course, influenced by who my parents are, right? So, you know, you guys, there's no secret. You all know my last name. You all know my first name, right? Like, my mom is, hmm? Okay, so my mom, my mom, just to give you guys a sense, my mom is Ngozi Okonjo Iwala. She's, uh, she's finance minister of Nigeria twice, okay? And has, you know, a bit of a public profile. Um, 
a bit, yeah. Um, you know, and I think, and in that sense, you know, now it comes into questions of values and what people, um, sort of what they project, right? And so, you know, the way that we grew up, we grew up with, in a household that I would say is relatively traditional in the American sense, right? It's, it was a traditional Nigerian household in the United States of America, right? If that makes any sense. So wrap your head around that. Sometimes I have a lot of trouble wrapping my head around that, you know, um, but I am who I am. Um, and I think the, the main, the core thing, and one of the core things that has driven me to write about what I write about is this idea that you have to, like ultimately you start from a position of trying to understand another person's experience and a position of fundamental respect, yet curiosity born out of respect, right? I think, I don't know if that gets to sort of this question about liberal values. And now if liberal values are saying to people who sit next to you or people that you see who are in a different position from you, I want to understand, I see you as an equal, I want to try and understand the life that you're living, then yes, I was raised with liberal values and I'm very proud of that. You know, and I think that it's important as a writer to have values that allow you to see outside of yourself and to experience a different kind of existence. Otherwise, you know, like, otherwise, I mean like otherwise we're not, we're not here for anything, right? Like if I, if I don't challenge myself and if I don't challenge what I see around me in terms of of, uh, in terms of value systems, then the purpose of, of my profession is kind of null. You know, I, and I don't know if that's getting at answering kind of the questions that you're asking. And so then when it comes now to the particular book that I wrote and the communities here, I would say that the LGBTQ community here has its own stories, right? And it has people here who will tell those stories and who are telling those stories. And the book I wrote is not about telling those stories, it's about telling a particular story that I conjured up in my head as a, as a desire to understand what someone's experience might be when they go through something like this. You know, and it's not, it's not for me to try and speak for any particular people, and it's not for me to try and profess or project any, any values that these are the right values or this is the right way of doing things. It is for me to say, here is an emotional situation here is, here is a, a particular construct, and how do we inhabit that emotional infer Man, these coffee people. <laughs> um, how do we inhabit this emotional situation, and then how can I bring somebody else who reads the book into that emotional situation? And if the book does that in some way, then it works. If it doesn't do that, then I deserve all the criticism that can be heaped upon me. Thank you. More questions? More questions. Yeah. Uh, this is a question for Tando. Tando, I'm also a South African, so it's nice for me to meet you at the Ake Book Festival. Unfortunately, I cannot meet you at your festival because your festival in Soweto excludes people like me. It's true. Uh, you know, as a young man, I had to break the law to visit Soweto. And as an old man, I'm so delighted that there is a book festival in Soweto, but dismayed that I'm still not allowed to attend. <laughs> but uh, here's a question for you. Uh, the, the question is, uh, you know, um, what you describe uh, in terms of the conflicts with the traditional leaders and society and people backlashing against your work, it's very much, uh, the context seems to, to me at least, to be very much conflicts that happen within a black world. And so, um, you know, given another context, given the, uh, the recent and over the last decade, several incidents of extreme violence between South Africans and people from other countries, my, my question is, is this a time in which a, a, a lens that wants to reduce all conflicts between people to a black and white lens, is that still useful in this time? Thank you very much. Oh man, hold up, hold up before you answer. <laughs> I, had, I had to cross my legs for that one because it's, <laughs> it's about to get real up in here. I, I, wow, and you brought out a bunch of questions. I just, I just want to, but, but like wow. <laughs> I, 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 uh, wow. <laughs> no, come and use my mic. You want to give him his 
Uh, so I'm not going to dignify this with, um, with an answer. I'm actually quite offended, uh, as all of these black people who are here are. I mean, you don't need me telling you that. But um, is there any South African here who might be more patient than me and might want to? No? None of them. Okay, I wanted the room. I, 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 I'm taking the comeback. Okay, I was going to give it to No, no, no. In fact, we are out of patience. So another question. We are not answering that question. Is there another question? Because I have questions. Okay. Oh, you can talk. And I, I, I actually do have to say something. I, you know. It's traumatic. I don't. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't like. I don't think we're going to be able to to continue without sort of addressing the way that that question was asked. And I think it's. You can, you can have all the concerns you want about being excluded from spaces. I think, number one, you're here now, right? And I think the thing is, when people invite you into a space, you know, like, and there is a seeming uh, disregard for, for, like, the hospitality that has been issued, that causes a lot of people to go, hmm, you know? And so I think what just happened in the way that you asked the question is perhaps why people get very wary of having folks come into spaces when people are just trying to talk about some, you know, like celebrate in a sense the difficult questions that have to be asked. Now there's a way I think to ask the question that you asked that would have elicited a very different response rather than sort of like this, this, uh, you know, like uh, this shock. <laughs> Um, and you know, I don't. I, I hope that you go back to spaces, and I hope that like this is in some ways like a lesson in terms of how you approach a set of people about an issue that is clearly very dear to you. But like, you can't do that, man. That's like that's not cool. I'm sorry. I just have to say that. Also, here's the thing: white people, men, rich people, straight people, eh? People who attend the World Economic Forum. You are not entitled to all the spaces. Okay. This may be hard for you to see or accept, but you are not entitled to all the spaces. I mean, certainly a white South African is not entitled to Abantu. You are not even entitled in the first place to our land. So we do not do that. And as a black, as an African woman, we know how, some, how unentitled we have been to a lot of things. So this question gets us when you want all women's spaces. You know, the men will come and say, why can't I come? You cannot come. <laughs> and so you must never ask that question in front of black people ever again. You've triggered us, it's traumatizing. You cannot ask that question. It's like yesterday, was it Jeff? Jeff, is Jeff here? There was a white man asking um, writers to talk about why they speak, they write in English, and he feels that sometimes something, he, I think he used the word transmogrified or some big English word. That cannot be asked because you can't ask us these questions. It's like asking, it's like a rapist asking the rape victim, so how do you deal with your trauma? Shut the fuck up and don't ask some questions. I was not going to do Kina, I was just going to be nice. But now this has happened. I have 10 minutes. Are you going to, I've, I've drawn a line under that question. So if you are going to respond, my sister, I'm going to ask you to put your, I'm not entertaining it anymore. We are moving on. Okay, good. Give her the mic. Um, thank you. Now that I have the mic, I can control what I say. <laughs> um, I'm, I would like to just, um, oh, I must stand up, okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad we're shifting this back to what it should be about. Um, I just wanna just pose a question because I've been really struggling with uh, the male voice and reading um, <clears throat> male writers. Um, it's just been very, very difficult for me because there's just like, 
something about that voice that I'm not getting. And um, I want to know, is it, as an author, is it, um, <clears throat> and this is the both of you, is it based on um, just like how men are, re like in society, how constructed in society and manhood, does that affect you as a writer in terms of the voice and the tone of your work? Or um, is it like based on what you've read other men write and then you kind of tend to follow suit with that? Because there's just like a commonality in terms of like a very, yeah. They, they become phallic texts. <laughs> um, so um, this is the conversation that I was having with, um, with Bibi recently while we're editing A Man Is Not A Man um, for the reissue. And in the text, there is, um, there is um, you know, a, a way in which I describe the landscape in the village, uh, talking about the mountain boobs, the, the yeah. And, and I had to think about, the, she's like, I mean, what the fuck is this? I mean, she loves the text, like, talk, account to me. And then I had to think about, why did I do that? Because, I mean, it's, it's a discomfort for me as well. And then I was like, no, here I was, being true to what I know. There's a mountain in the former trans guy in the Eastern Cape that is called Mabele Ntoumbi, right? A, you know, girl's breast. And when I was writing, I was thinking about that. I was using that mountain. I was not making that stuff up. Um, and that's how our society is. Um, and I was thinking, you know, if this thing was appearing once in the text, we would remove it now, no matter what the explanation is. But, you know, it's in the text, it's part of the humor, it's, it's you know, it's that. And it makes me very uncomfortable. It's making me think about this, making me conscious about how I write. Um, so, so it's an ongoing thought for me, but there's no question about it. It's all of those things that, that you have mentioned. It's patriarchy, it's how society is. And it's, it would take a lot of consciousness, a lot of unlearning for men, for men writers to deliberately, consciously not be violent in their texts. So I, just to build on what you've said, and I think to, to add a bit, you know, I think, again, going back to what I think literature is for um, and what it's supposed to do, right, is it's supposed to, again, hopefully when done well, take you from where you are, the own body that you inhabit, into another person's emotional state. And in some cases, if it's done really well, take you into their, into their, into a physical space or something akin to that physical space. I think you know, when you start talking about male voices or female voices, I think in a lot of ways, what that, what that suggests to me in many ways is literature that doesn't do that, right? And so if you're, if you're reading a voice that is in a sense like nakedly stereotypically male in a book, um, it's because in many ways that whoever is writing that book hasn't developed a full character, right? And uh, you know, I say this just because if you think about it, if you're trying to suggest, um, if you need to create a character who is, in a sense, like a misogynistic man, you're going to need a misogynistic voice. You're going to need to construct that, but that voice needs to be constructed and it has to be consistent with the character that you're making and, then, and, the, and the, the sort of like, and the story itself, right? And you know, this is where, where I think you know, again, you then get into like who has a right to write what voice, right? And you know, for me, one of the things again is, as a writer, it's important for me to challenge myself to not to write not just male voices, but also female voices. You know, to not write just straight voices, but also LGBTQ voices. To not write just black voices, but you know, Chinese voices or whatever. And I think it's a really important exercise as a writer to write that and to write outside of yourself and as a reader to try and consume outside of yourself as well and to consume outside of your experience. Now there are two things. One is that in trying to do that, you will invariably get it wrong. And first and foremost, it's okay to get it wrong. It's just not okay to get it wrong um, without having tested your ideas with people 
who are from a different perspective, right? So if I'm going to write a female voice or try to write a female voice, then rest, like, I'll make sure that I have people that I really trust who understand the story that I'm trying to tell and also who have a perspective that's completely different from my own and a voice and an understanding that's completely different from my own to tell me, listen, dude, you're getting this wrong. This is not, this is not okay. This is not something that represents one. And two, this is not okay within the construct of your character because it doesn't ring true to them. And I think when you're dealing with fiction or if you're dealing with an artistic project, you have to think of it on all of those levels and you can't just kind of knock something off because it has a particular writer and a particular voice. You have to think internally is it consistent, but also I think externally is the person aware of all the issues and the power dynamics that occur when you are writing you know, in a different voice, or if you're writing as a man and writing a male voice, are you aware of what sort of power exists within you and what p power has been traditionally pushed upon you? And are you thinking about how you do something different with that power as you write? Because that is exactly what literature is for. That's, at least that's why I write, is trying to address those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm closing the session. Is here to tell me we are up. Please give them a round of applause. Go and buy the books. Thank you.